Good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to the Regional Transportation Committee Tuesday, February 16th meeting. I will call to order the meeting at 8.31 a.m. Uh, next item, public comments. Uh, Mr. Kennedy, do we have anybody for public comment? All right, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, at this moment, I don't see any hands raised at this time. All right, thank you, Mr. Kennedy. Uh, we'll close public comment at 8.31. Um, item three is the December uh, 15th RTC meeting summary. Uh, are there any revisions to this? Um, if so, please raise your virtual hand. Mr. Kennedy, uh, do we have any hands being raised? There are no hands being raised at this time, uh, Mr. Chair. Thank you, sir. Um, with that, we will move on to the action item se section of the agenda. Item 4, 2020-2023 Transportation Improvement Program Amendments. Mr. Cottrell, please. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, so good morning, RTC members. Um, this morning we have four amendments for your consideration. Um, the first is a brand new project um, from Castle Rock, um, and it is for the I-25 and Crystal Valley interchange. Um, the funding comes from uh, $5.4 million of a build grant, and this will be for pre-construction activities um, that will eventually lead up to construction. A uh, second project is also new from CDOT Region 1, and this is to rebuild walls, uh, rebuild noise walls along I-70 within the metro area. Uh, this will use $9.7 million of the CDOT allocated COVID relief funding. The third project is um, Region 4 I-25 and State Highway 119 interchanges and park and ride improvements. Um, this amendment will add $6.1 million in construction funding in FY21. And finally, for your consideration this morning is a project from Region 1 for the I-25 Valley Highway. Uh, this will add $45 million in HPTE loans and $15.5 million in Senate Bill 267 funding for the purchase of the Burham Yard property. Um, with that, uh, I'll be happy to take any comments or questions you may have. Um, if not, the motion before you is to recommend to the board these amendments to the 20 to 23 tip. Thank you, Mr. Cottrell. Committee members, if there's any questions or comments on this item, please raise your virtual hand or press star six if you are on the phone. Mr. Kennedy, I will turn it to you for uh, hands, questions or comments. Okay, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I will give it a moment to see if anybody has any questions. So I don't see any hands raised at this time, Mr. Chair. All right, thank you, Mr. Kennedy. With no questions or comments before us, I am happy to entertain a motion. If you'd like to present a motion, please raise your virtual hand or press star six if you're on the phone. Mr. Kennedy, yep. I will turn it to you. All right, thank you, Mr. Chair. I do see a hand raised from uh, Wen Shaw. So uh, when you're ready, Wen, you've been unmuted. Please go ahead. Thank you. I move approval of the uh, actions uh, covered before um, us, the two new projects and uh, the 2018-015 and 2020-086 project. All right, thank you, Director Shaw. We are looking for a second, Mr. Kennedy. All right, I see a, a hand raised from Sh uh, Shannon Gifford. Uh, Shannon, when you're ready, please go ahead. Mm -hmm. uh, you, you might be self-muted on your end. Oh, here we go. Okay, I'm sorry. I was having trouble figuring it out. I second the motion. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Gifford. Um, with with a motion and a second before us, uh, Mr. Kennedy, please uh, open the phone line so we can uh, vote. Okay. Uh, they have been unmuted, Mr. Chair. All right. Thank you. Uh, um, all those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Hi. And um sorry. Against? 
I just thought it was it was interesting at the end they didn't really Deborah Johnson said they're going to bring back the folks. You know, that'd be motion um, something in 60 days like a proposal hopefully that yeah. includes the You're not, the, I think the we have a, but it wasn't as explicit at the end as I thought it was going to be but at least I felt like that was where it was headed so I'm curious Thank you very much. All right. Uh, thank you very much, everybody. Uh, the next item, item five, uh, fiscal year 2020, fiscal year 2021, unified planning work group program amendments. Mr. Cottrell, please. Thank you again, Mr. Chair. Uh, so in attachment C, we have amendments to the uh, fiscal year 2020, 2021 unified planning work program or UPWP. So as you recall, the UPWP is a required document uh, that serves as a tool for the scheduling, budgeting, and monitoring of all the planning activities for the MPO. Um, the, the amendments before you this morning include adjustments to the tasks and deliverables. So I just want to run through a few of the more notable items. Um, these include additional MetroVision deliverables within a, Objective 3, uh, including conducting additional research into COVID-19. Uh, beginning Dr. Cog-led corridor planning services within activity 3.3 and updating the congestion mitigation toolkit as outlined in activity 5.1. Um, so of course these are not uh, a list of the complete uh, amendments before you this morning, um, but a complete list is included within the attachment uh, within track changes. Um, so unless you have any comments or questions regarding the amendments before you, uh, we'd be happy to take a motion um, before you to uh, recommend to the board these amendments to the 20 and 21 UPWP. All right. Uh, thank you, Mr. Cottrell. Committee members, if there are questions, comments, or after a slight pause, uh, a motion, please feel free to raise your virtual hand or press star six. Mr. Kennedy, I will turn it to you. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I do see one hand raised from uh, Joan Peck. So, Joan, you're uh, unmuted. So, when you're ready, uh, please go ahead. Um, I move the approval of the proposed amendments to the uh, fiscal year 2020-2021 unified planning program. Thank you, Director Peck. We are looking for a second. Please raise your virtual hand. Please I start. do see. A, I, I thank you, Mr. Chair. I do see a second hand raised from uh, Kate Williams. So, Kate, uh, when you're ready, go ahead. So, uh, second the motion. Thank you, Director Williams. Appreciate it. All right, with a uh, with a motion and a second, Mr. Kennedy, we will open the lines and see what we get. And okay, you got it. The lines have been unmuted, Mr. Chair. All, right. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. Uh, aye. 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 Yes. Abstain. Motion carries. Thank you, everyone. Uh, the next item. Fixing America's Surface Transportation Act 2021 safety targets. Mr. Sanchez, please. Mr. Sanchez, we're not hearing you at the moment. Uh, you may be self-muted. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Sorry about that. No worries. Let me pull up my PDF real quick. All right, good morning, RTC members. Uh, I came before y'all a couple months ago to discuss two different areas of our federal targets. Today, I'll be discussing our safety targets, which we set annually. Uh, over the, this will be the fourth time that we're taking this action on our safety targets. Uh, the previous three actions uh, have been specific to the Dr. Cog region, so we haven't been supporting the state's targets when we <clears> set safety <throat> targets. We receive our data from the Colorado Department of Transportation, and we use that to set targets for number and rate of fatalities, number and rate of serious injuries, and number of non-motorized fatalities and serious injuries. Now, the calculation we use is a five-year average, 
And since these are the federal targets, as with all of them, they're near term, so they're intended to be realistic and achievable. Now, I mentioned we set targets specific to the Dr. Cog area. That's specific to our Metropolitan Planning Organization area, so the green on the screen. When we get the data from CDOT, they have already geolocated crashes that have occurred on their system within our region. Our staff then uh, takes that next step of geolocating all the remaining crashes to all the public roads within our MPO area so we can set our targets. I mentioned this is the fourth cycle that we are taking an action on our federal safety targets. So we wanted to provide a snapshot of what the last three cycles have looked like in terms of whether we've been meeting our targets for fatalities, serious injuries, and non-motorized fatalities and serious injuries. While we are a month and a half into 2021, we won't have finalized data from CEDA until later this year. So that's why you're still seeing uh, pending um, status on our 2020 targets. Over the last few years, Dr. Cog has taken some actions towards uh, improving safety and achieving our safety targets. In the 2020 to 2023 tip, we had about $1.9 billion worth of projects that were improving safety. Last summer, the board adopted taking action on Regional Vision Zero. Uh, we're currently developing a complete streets toolkit, and those recommendations have been incorporated into the 2050 Metro Vision Regional Transportation Plan. And then within the 2050 Metro Vision Regional Transportation Plan, we've included uh, a specific list of projects and programs that are designed to improve safety and get us to Vision Zero. Now, since this is the first round of federal targets that we are taking action on, since we adopted taking action on Regional Vision Zero, we brought this as an informational item before the board back in December to see, to get their pulse on the horizon year for achieving zero fatalities and zero serious injuries. In terms of fatalities, you can see there was a clear indication for 2040. While for zero serious injuries, that was uh, more distributed from the board. So we took both of these responses to set our methodology. Now the previous method for the three cycles that you saw previously used, a, used the current 2040 traffic fatalities target from MetroVision, so fewer than 100 by 2040. For serious injuries, we took a hold the line method. So preventing serious injuries from increasing despite our increase in employment, uh, VMT and population. And then our non-motorized targets were based on a combination of those methods. The new method that we're pivoting to is getting us to zero fatalities by 2040 and zero serious injuries by 2045. So taking the principle outlined and taking action on regional vision zero. Now what that looks like for each of the federal measures, uh, we have data, like I mentioned, only for 2019. We don't have finalized 2020 data. So we had 270 fatalities in the MPO area in 2019. To get to zero fatalities by 2040, you're looking at an average yearly reduction of 13 fatalities. For serious injuries, you can see we've actually managed to hold the line as we were proposing. Uh, in 2019, we had 1,764 serious injuries. To get to zero serious injuries by 2045, you're looking at a reduction of 68 serious injuries every year. And then our non-motorized fatalities and serious injuries takes a combination of both of those. So zero fatalities, non-motorized fatalities by 2040 and zero non-motorized serious injuries by 2045. So you can see there's respective average yearly reductions for those as well. Uh, our last available data point that we have for 2019 showed 371 non-motorized fatalities and serious injuries in the region. So our proposed targets are on the screen and were included in the presentation packet. Um, while we are setting 2021 targets, I did mention that they were a five-year average. So these take the average of data for 2017, 2018, 2019, 2020, and 2021. Next steps would be board approval, uh, and then that would allow us to meet our federal deadline at the end of the month. Um, I mentioned that this was our first step towards realigning our targets. So um, we're taking this action for our federal targets, which are very near term. And then we're looking at adoption of the 2050 MVRTP in April, where we'll also be articulating zero fatalities and zero serious injuries. And ultimately, this would lead up to a future MetroVision amendment later this year to finalize these Vision Zero targets in, term, in the long term. Before I get to the measure, I did just want to do a quick plug for a new performance measures webpage that we have. We're hoping it acts as a resource for staff, 
uh, from the local agencies, state and federal partners. We'll have the latest available information for our targets. Um, these presentations are information that we have available for folk to use. And with that, our requested motion is to move to recommend to the Dr. Cog Board of Directors the 2021 FAST Act safety targets. I'll pause here if there are any questions. Thank you, Mr. Sanchez. Committee members, are there any questions or comments on the presentation at this point in time? If so, please raise your virtual hand or press star six on your phone. Mr. Kennedy, I will turn to you. If there are any hands raised. All right, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, at this moment, I don't see any hands raised. Thank you very much. With no questions or comments, I am happy to entertain a motion. Again, uh, please raise your virtual hand or press star six and Mr. Kennedy will call on you. Okay, thank you, Mr. Chair. I see a hand raised from uh, Kate Williams. So uh, Kate, when you're ready, please go ahead. Yes, I'd like to move this motion forward. I move that we move the motion forward. <laughs> thank you, Dr. Williams, appreciate it. Um, with the motion, we need a second, please. Uh, raise your virtual hand. Uh, uh, Mr. Chair, I see a second hand has been raised by Joan Peck. Uh, Joan, when you're ready, please go ahead. I second the motion. Thank you, Director Peck. All right, with uh, with a motion and a second, uh, Mr. Kennedy, please uh, open the phone lines so we can vote. Okay, they have been uh, unmuted, Mr. Chair. All right, all those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Against? Same? Motion carries unanimously. Thank you, everyone. The next item, um, special interest seat on the Transportation Advisory Committee, Mr. Rieger. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Good morning, everyone. Jacob Rieger, Long Range Transportation Planning Manager, Dr. Kong. No presentation for this one, but this concerns uh, membership on our Transportation Advisory Committee. One of the roles of this committee, of the Regional Transportation Committee, is to approve um, membership for what we call the seven special interest seats on TAC. These are subject matter experts um, in fields related to transportation planning to help the Transportation Advisory Committee do its work. Um, due to a recent retirement, we have a vacancy on the uh, special interest seat that we call the non-RTD transit seat. So in consultation with our distinguished chair, we are proposing to fill that seat uh, with Mr. Frank Bruno, who's the CEO of VM Mobility. Um, so we are asking for a motion from, or actually, actually asking for approval uh, from RTC to approve uh, that RTD, non-RTD special interest seat nomination for the Transportation Advisory Committee. And with that, I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Mr. Rieger. Um... Many members, any questions or comments? Uh, I don't think there will be, so I will, uh, I will also ask for a motion as well. So uh, please feel free to raise your virtual hand or press star six if you have questions or comments or would like to pre present a motion. All right, thank you, Mr. Chair. I do see a hand has been raised by Kate Williams uh, mm -hmm. and you've now been unmuted. So when you're ready, please go ahead. I promise this is my last time this morning. I would very much um, like to accept this action. Um, via mobility is a vital part of transportation in the greater Denver area. They, particularly during the pandemic, have really risen to the service. And I think that Frank will be a, um, a vital part of the committee. So I'd like to move that we accept his nomination. Thank you very much, Mr. Williams. Appreciate it. Uh, uh, we're looking for a second, please. I do see another hand has been raised by uh, Wen Shaw. So, uh, Director Shaw, when you're ready, go ahead. Thank you. I second this motion. Thank you, Director Shaw. All right, with a motion and a second on the table, uh, Mr. Kennedy, can you please open the lines so we can vote? <clears throat> Absolutely, Mr. Chair. Uh, the lines have been opened. All right. Thank you very much. Uh, all those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 
Against? Abstain? Motion carries unanimously. Thank you, everyone. The next section of the agenda, informational briefings. Item eight, Advanced Mobility Partnership Annual Update. Ms. Lindsay, please. Good morning, everyone. Uh, let me just get this slideshow up for you. All right. So my name is Emily Lindsay. I'm the Transportation Technology Strategist at Dr. Cog. Um, which is a lot of words for saying I work with you all and member governments and stakeholders on transportation technology projects in the region. So I'm going to just provide you a quick overview before getting into an update on our last year. Um, for those of you familiar with Mobility Choice Blueprints, this might be a little bit of a refresher, uh, but I just want to make sure we're all starting on the same page here. Um, Mobility Choice Blueprint, again, was really that collaborative planning process uh, that included CDOT, Dr. Cog. RTD in the Denver Metro Chamber, and it really looked at transportation technology and the impact on livability, mobility, all the way throughout our region. And so this was really about considering transportation technology's impact on the future of mobility in the region, uh, making sure that it's supporting our high quality of life um, now and in the future. And this really dealt with a variety of different themes um, from regional collaboration to shared mobility, uh, to data, electrification, um, and even driverless vehicle preparation. So it definitely dealt with a host of different issues related to transportation technology. And so once the plan was completed, again, that's the MCB, the Mobility Choice Blueprint, uh, we really needed a way to start to implement different aspects of this plan. Uh, the plan identified over 30 tactical actions um, for partner agencies to collaborate on um, that would improve, you know, our region, region standing as we uh, adopt and deploy different transportation technologies in the region. So in late 2019, uh, the Advanced Mobility Partnership, or AMP, um, was established. And this was really developed so that we had kind of that mechanism to implement the plan. So to bring it kind of from paper to action. And so there's two different facets of this uh, partnership. There's kind of the way that we want to serve as a forum for education um, and coordination but also in a way that we want to uh, start implementing some of those tactical actions. And so the AMP is set up. There are two kind of primary committees. Uh, the AMP working group, which meets every month, it's a mix of AMP partner agencies, but also stakeholders from the public and private sector in our region. Um, and like I said, those folks meet monthly and they kind of really guide the work that the AMP is, is um, undertaking. And then the AMP Executive Committee, who meets quarterly, is executive leadership from Dr. Cog, CDOT, RTD, and the Denver Metro Chamber. And they're really responsible for identifying kind of our policy level priorities, forwarding any recommendations to the appropriate body. Um, but if anything <laughs> that you take away from this chart is that it involves a lot of different players and a lot of different stakeholders. There's consultation with groups like UL, with our Regional Transportation Operations Working Group, um, with CDOT, with RTD. Uh, with a variety of different stakeholders. And so in our first year, uh, our first full year, which is 2020, I just wanted to give you guys an overview of what we have kind of accomplished and the direction of where we're going. So of course, with any new partnership, we started off identifying and assembling different partners. So we worked to identify stakeholders for both of those groups. And then we conducted some initial outreach and engagement to really build out our AMP network. And you'll see there's just a, a sample of the different organizations that are involved um, in the working group. It ranges from our public agencies, uh, cities, county, towns, um, to nonprofit partners like the RAC, um, like some of our TMAs. And then we even have uh, folks from private sector. Uh, we have Ford, Easy Mile, all kinds of all kinds of folks. So it's pretty broad coalition, um, and we wanted to work together on this. So, of course, we had to build a website, <laughs> landing page. Welcome to the region. Uh, check this out if you haven't seen it already. It's advancedmobilitypartnership.org. This is really where we keep all of the um, AMP specific resources. Again, since it's a partner coalition, uh, we need to distinguish it from any of the one single partner agencies itself. Um, and we worked really hard with the stakeholders to prioritize the 30 plus different tactical actions in each of those different areas to identify some kind of priority tactical action uh, for AMP next steps. Not that we, we think that any of the 32 are less important than um, 
the others, but we really needed some guidance in terms of where to start. So identifying some of those foundational items uh, was pretty critical. And we identified uh, about 10 different tax options in these three focus areas of shared mobility, system operations, and data and data sharing. And we established some steering committees and assembled sub subject matter experts to kind of chart out what work on each of these tactical actions uh, would look like. And so over the spring and summer of 2020, we developed some work plans and identified next steps. We all went through uh, kind of this roadmap process uh, for each of those three different steering committees to dive into the tactical actions, identify activities uh, that would support those, and to kind of lay out our work plan uh, ahead of us. And so to do this, uh, once we wrapped up the identification of the roadmap, we confirmed our priorities with our executive committee um, and, and produced this document so that it was transparent to all of our partners and all of the partner agencies, uh, what we were looking to accomplish. And so in addition to some of that initial planning and visioning level work on those tactical actions, we also wanted to make sure that we were kind of serving the other purpose, right? Of being a monthly forum for coordination and discussion um, on transportation technology projects in the region. And so just to give you a, a little snapshot of some of the topics, uh, the whole list is multiple slides long, so I'm not gonna do that to you all today, uh, but really addressing things like electrification efforts, shared micromobility, uh, mobility as a service, um, autonomous transit connection projects. We really wanted to bring different partners uh, from both the public sector and some of the um, nonprofit and more collaborative projects that are happening in the region together so that we can hear about pilots and we can learn about next steps um, and we can kind of move forward without duplicating any efforts. And so that was a very quick overview of our very first year of the Advanced Mobility Partnership. But if you or your staff are interested in, in participating or learning more, please feel free to reach out. I'd be happy to take questions. Thank you very much, Ms. Lindsay. Uh, committee members, are there any questions or comments on this presentation? If so, please raise your virtual hand or press star six on your phone. Mr. Kennedy, I will turn it to you for questions or comments. Okay, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, at this moment, I do not see any hands raised at this time. Mr. Chairman. Uh, Executive Director Rex, please. Thank you, sir, very much. I, I just want to make a quick comment related to this, and I wanted to thank um, everybody that's been involved in, in this and just keeping it on the forefront. Um, you know, it's kind of a, it's a difficult time, uh, you know, to have conversations about technology or maybe it's the right time to have, have conversations about technology given the, given the um, um, you know, kind of the, the mobility kind of lull that we have right now. Um, but this is, this is tremendous. I mean, as everybody knows, this is came, this initiative came out of the mobility choice concept and, um, and I think everybody, all the partners have been working very, very well together. And some of the recommendations and some of the some of the areas in which we're we're going to explore further over the next year, I think are fantastic. And I'm really looking forward to further discussion. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Executive Director Rex. Thank you, Mrs. Lindsay. Uh, appreciate the presentation. We will move on to the next item on the agenda, item nine, status update on the 2050 Metro Vision Regional Transportation Plan. Mr. Rieger. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Good morning again, everyone. Give me just a second. Okay, can everyone see my screen? We can. Okay, great. So Alvin and I wanted to give you all a status update on the 2050 MetroVision Regional Transportation Plan. Um, I'll start by saying that since this information went in your packet, we're actually pleased to announce that we released the draft 2050 plan document to the region on Friday, this last Friday, the 12th, uh, for regional public comment review. Um, this is our 30-day public and stakeholder comment review period, um, culminating in a public hearing that we'll have in front of the Dr. Cog board on March 17th. Um, so the plan is out there. Hopefully, most of you received the announcement directly. Um, if you did not and you're interested, and uh, didn't see the information, um, please reach out to us and we're happy to get that to you. Um, but the plan is out there. There's a lot of great information. Uh, we built an engagement website um, to help people kind of navigate through the plan and uh, find what's of interest to them. So with that background, we did want to sort of um, catch you up just a little bit. It's been a couple months um, since we talked to you about the plan. 
Um, so we wanted to wanted to kind of give you a status update of where we are um, as the plan gets out there for review. So today we're actually going to talk about just a couple of things. Um, I want to touch on a little bit on air quality conformity determination, one of our key federal requirements for uh, the regional transportation plan. Um, already started talking about the draft document, and the public comment review period, and then we wanted to give you just a brief overview of the overall financial plan um, that underpins the larger uh, 2050 regional transportation plan. <clears throat> So starting with air quality conformity determination, probably the most exciting, but one of the most important topics um, in the plan. A lot of words on this slide. I'm not going to go through this slide in great detail, but the bottom line here is that um, there are several criteria pollutants that we are federally required uh, to address as part of the 2050 plan document. Air quality conformity for the regional transportation plan is based on the entire plan, so it's not individual projects. It's the entire plan as a whole, and it's the project uh, investment priorities, the entirety of that network um, that's contained within uh, the regional transportation plan. These are the projects that you all approved back in your November meeting. Um, so we do air quality conformity uh, modeling in conjunction with the state, and we use the budgets that are set for us in the state implementation plan for air quality. Um, so the bottom line, as you see at the bottom of the slide, is that yes, the 2050 RTP did pass all emissions budget tests. By the same token, I know that we've all had a lot of conversation about House Bill 1261, uh, which is included in the plan, um, to the extent that we were able to, given the time frame of both our planning process and the implementation of House Bill 1261. Um, as I've talked about with our board, um, we have acknowledged that in the future we will need to do a plan amendment uh, once 1261 is fully implemented, um, and that conversation is included, or that discussion is included in the draft 2050 plan document. Um, so again, I mentioned the plan is out for public review. Um, hopefully, so now that it's out there, hopefully we can um, truth, truth test ourselves in terms of the things we were aiming for. Um, but we wanted a plan that was really visually compelling um, and engaging for all audiences. And I think actually that we've done that. Um, this is the most sort of design oriented, graphically oriented plan I think we've ever produced um, at Dr. Cog. Um, you all have been a big part along with many others of the work that we've done together over the past almost two years. And we wanted this document to really tell that planning story about how we all work together. This really is the region's uh, long range transportation plan with really key and important input uh, from local governments, from CDOT, from RTD, our toll highway authorities and all our other stakeholders. So we really wanted the plan to capture that collaboration. Um, there are a lot of federal requirements that we need to address in our planning process, so those are included as well. And then ultimately, we wanted this plan to really set the region up to lead to its implementation. You know, the long-range plan really sets that multimodal transportation vision uh, for the region, um, really, you know, sets those project and program investment priorities. Um, so we wanted to structure this plan uh, to facilitate implementing those shared priorities um, that we've all identified together. Um, you know, it's funny how, how quickly the plans progress since we put in these uh, initial screenshots, but this gives you um, at least a little taste of an idea of, you know, how the plan document is structured, how we're trying to make it visually compelling. Um, so this gives you a sense of what you can expect to see. And for those of you that um, have been with us for some time and are used to our previous uh, transportation plans, this one will look very different to you. Um, so as I mentioned, we did release the plan on February 12th, this last Friday, um, and we'll have a public hearing in front of our board on March 17th. Um, so during the next 30 days, uh, we have numerous engagement activities planned during the public comment period. We'll be speaking to a whole bunch of groups, whether it's county transportation forums, um, uh, city uh, transportation advisory board meetings, um, and other forums. We'll also have three uh, virtual open houses. And there's also ways for people to get engaged and give your feedback on the plan when you go to our engagement website. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to my colleague, Alvin Vidal Sanchez, to talk about the financial plan. Alvin? Thanks, Jacob. So we provided some updates on the financial plan throughout the development process. We did provide, but we did want to provide a holistic overview today. Um, we do want to make clear that while we're going to be using terms like fiscal constraint and cost feasibility, the MVRTP isn't a budget document. It's not the TIP or the STIP, but it's about developing a funding framework for what our priority investments are and establishing that long-range vision. 
since staff were intentional over the summer about soliciting and including multimodal projects and programs, we also wanted to be intentional about the resources that we were bringing to bear in the financial plan. So there are three parts of our financial plan. There's the revenue forecast, so just determining how much funding we think is available over the next 30 years. Expenditure categories, where we determine what, what percentage of that money can go to specific projects and what's going to allocations or programs. And then taking into account the project costs, so being able to prioritize the projects that we're using with our limited regional funding. Next slide. Now for the different three regional agencies, we did want to provide some assumptions that, were take, that we took into account as we developed these revenues. For the Dr. Cog side, we rely on CDOT's program distribution. Uh, we worked with them and the other MPOs to develop the 2045 program distribution, and then we assumed some additional regional revenue coming into play. For CDOT, they assumed a high revenue scenario in the program distribution, and their focus with their revenues was on implementing the 10-year strategic pipeline of projects. When it came to RTD, we worked closely with them uh, at the beginning of our financial plan process, but as a re result of COVID-19, we did receive some updated forecasts just to reflect the impact of the pandemic on their finances. Uh, similarly, they prioritized maintaining and operating the existing system over expansion projects. Some additional key takeaways include, um, we made assumptions about federal discretionary grants, we worked with the toll authorities in the region to make sure we were including their investments, their revenues, their projects and programs in the plan. And then when it was specified, we included the project sponsors funding assumptions for the project. We break our funding out into five categories. There's the Dr. Cog administered funds. So uh, funds you're probably most familiar with through our transportation improvement program process. On the CDOT side, this includes state and federal funding that we're anticipating being available to be spent on the regional roadway system in the region. RTD is always the largest of the three regional agencies in terms of the funding available. This includes their sales and use tax and fare box revenues and then their assumptions for FTA formula grants. The next category is funding that we anticipate being available to be spent on the regional roadway system. So that can include the toll authorities, our federal discretionary grants, and then what the local governments are spending on the regional roadway system. And then the last category is all the funding that's spent off of that system. So the local roads, the minor arterials, the collector roads, and what's being spent on those by the local governments. Uh, you can skip this slide, Jacob. The next piece of our financial plan are our expenditure categories. So we break this down into our multimodal capital projects and our programmatic investments. The capital projects are those projects that are individually listed in the plan. They include our roadway and transit capacity projects, which you've historically seen, as well as our priority vision zero safety, active transportation and freight projects that we solicited over the summer and included in the plan. Our programmatic investments are the remaining amount of funding that's going to allocations. So we know, for example, that there's gonna be money spent on sidewalks on local bus service in the region, but we don't list out all of the sidewalks or all of the fixed route bus service. So that's just included as an allocation in the plan to reflect the continued investment. Now looking at the three regional agencies and how that breakdown looks, since Dr. Cog has the most flexibility with Dr. Cog administered funds, we did program the majority of Dr. Cog funding to specific projects, both roadway and transit projects and our priority safety freight active transportation projects. And then the remaining is going towards those allocations, those freight set-asides, the safety set-asides, our tip set-asides. Conversely, the other two regional agencies, CEDA and RTD, program the majority of their funding towards their programmatic investments. So maintaining, operating, enhancing the existing system over system expansion. And then the last piece is taking project costs. So Dr. Cog staff relies on cost estimates, cost estimates provided by the project sponsor. They're intended to include all phases to get the project open to traffic or service. The costs are tied to when the, the project sponsor thinks the project will be open. And so that allows us to do our air quality modeling and it also allows us to do our fiscal constraint analysis where we place these projects throughout the plan's horizon year. Uh, 
it also allows us to take into account the future cost of that project. So understanding that a project today is going to cost more tomorrow. And an example of what that analysis looks like, we take our revenues and inflate those out each year to 2050. We combined those within some five-year periods just to be able to do our fiscal constraint analysis and give us some flexibility. So in this example, with our Dr. Cog STBG funding, within the period from 2021 to 2025, you can see we have $225 million in year of expenditure. We did that same future cost for project costs. The as an example, you can see there's a project cost of $100 million. We inflate that to when we think the project is gonna be open to traffic or service based on the project sponsor's anticipated timeline. So in this example, you can see that's in 2033. So that $100 million project becomes a $135 million project and it would use up money within the 2031 to 2035 period. So that allows us to perform our cost feasible analysis and make sure we're not over programming projects and programs and spending more money than we think we have available throughout the 30 years. So ultimately that allows us to prove that the 2050 RTP is fiscally constrained. So our project costs aren't exceeding the revenues we think we'll have available. That's true in current year dollars and our future year of expenditure dollars. Uh, we worked with CDOT, RTD, our federal partners, and then the toll authorities and local governments to make sure we had the best available information for revenue assumptions, as well as making sure we had the best information for their agency, their program, and their expenditure categories. And with that, we're happy to take any questions. Sure. Thank you very much, Mr. Rieger and Mr. Sanchez. Uh, Committee members, if there are any any questions, please raise your virtual hand or press star six. Mr. Kennedy, I will turn it over to you for questions or comments. Okay, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, at this moment, I am not seeing any hands raised uh, at this time. All right, thank you, Mr. Kennedy. And again, thank you, Mr. Rieger, and thank you, Mr. Sanchez. We appreciate the presentation. Uh, the next item, uh, next section is administrative items. Uh, item 10, committee, I'm sorry, member comments or other matters. If there are any uh, comments or other matters to be brought before the RTC, please feel free to raise your virtual hand or press star six. Mr. Kennedy, I will turn it to you if there's any raised. Okay, thank you, Mr. Chair. I do see one hand raised from uh, Ms. Ashley uh, Stolzman. So you're unmuted now, Ashley. So uh, go ahead when you're ready. Thank you. Oh. Thank you. Let's try that again. Go ahead. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, Mr. Chair, just on behalf of the entire Regional Transportation Committee, I'd like to thank you for your excellent service this last year. Um, just so many um, un unforeseeable uh, obstacles have been thrown in your way and you've done a magnificent job leading us through the darkness. Um, so thank you so much for all the effort you've put in and just what a fantastic job you've done. And we all are very grateful for your service. Thank you. Anybody else, Mr. Kennedy? No, I do not see anyone else uh, at the time. All right, uh, thank you very much, Mr. Kennedy. As as Vice Chair Stoltzman um, sort of alluded to, it, this is my last meeting uh, as the RTC Chair. Um, uh, it, it continues to be a pleasure to uh, to serve my local municipality, but also to to gather with other um, other agencies or entities. Uh, in a collaborative fashion, I view uh, RTC as a as a symbol of our regional collaboration. Um, um, again, continually humbled by my my board members who have um, repeatedly voted me onto the executive committee and um, into the chairmanship. Uh, I will leave you in the very 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 capable hands of Louisville Mayor Vice Chair, soon to be Chair Stolzman of the uh, Dr. Cog and RTC. And with that, again, thank you so much, everyone. Uh, our next meeting will be March 16th, where Chair Stolzman will, will take the helm. 
And with no other matters before the RTC, I will adjourn the meeting at 9.15. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Mr. Chairman.